Well, hi again. It's good to have you with me. God's Word is just so full of good stuff. Join me in looking at uh, some of the things that I'm digging out of Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul has been into this, and he talks about sin, the sin of the Jew, the sin of the Gentile, and he talks about God's saving grace and a righteousness that is by faith from first to last and so on. He gets to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, uh, <clears throat> there, there is um, a word that starts with therefore. And uh, the, the therefore is kind of, you, you got to take it with all that's gone before. But, but let me just pick it up here. Therefore. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces Hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his, love, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Ah, oh, this is so rich. Well, it would just take a lot of time to unpack everything. And maybe we'll get a chance to do that in another venue. But today, I want to comb out some things just out of verse 5. <clears throat> I want you to join me in the fun of prospecting. This little expedition through Romans, Romans is going to be kind of like prospecting. You know, you and I could go up here to Murray, Idaho, and we could pan for gold in the placer, placer mining rubble that's left over up there on the way to Murray. That's quite a bit of it. Or we could just dig into the rich ore of the book of Romans and discover its nuggets of spiritual truth. Now, there are some hazards in this venture. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was reading... Uh, <clears throat> I uh, picked up some quotes. The book of Romans is the most profound work in existence and the most weighty of all Paul's writings. Oh, really? Wow, that's heavy. This same author, John Cairns, says, The gospel tide nowhere forms so many deep, dark pools where the neophyte, <laughs> that's the beginner, may drown. Oh, that's that's heavy. Okay. First, <clears throat> let's joyfully join the succession of the saved. Now, there are lots of people who found righteousness. Noah, Abraham, so on in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, man, it just explodes. 3,000, 5,000, and then there are people being saved constantly through the New Testament. And Ever since then, and all over the world, God has been redeeming people to himself. It is absolutely awesome. But you know, the book of Romans figured prominently in every period of evangelical renaissance. That's the rebirth of evangelism. It begins with individuals like Augustine, Luther, Wesley, but then it blossoms into, into movements. Uh, you know, the Roman Catholics went through a time when they became very evangelistic. I've tromped around over Guatemala and Bolivia extensively and many other countries also, but everywhere in the jungles of Guatemala, all over everywhere, there are Roman Catholic churches. You know, some of them were built shortly, man, four or five years after 
after uh, Columbus arrived in the Americas. It's amazing. And, and they, those Roman Catholic priests went everywhere and started churches and they evangelized people. I, I have just been impressed at the intensity with which they went about it. Now, I know Roman Catholicism has some problems, but it has been evangelistic in its history. Or Lutheranism out of Martin Luther, Methodism influenced by John Wesley, the Anglican priest. Let's just, let's just take a look at some of these. I can't take a look at all of them, but some of them. The Apostle Paul himself said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Well, then think about the influence of uh, St. Augustine. Man, he was converted out of a, a nasty life. He, he, he was a, I guess you could say he was a bad person. But one day he was reading in the book of Romans in chapter 13, where it says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness. You see, that's where he was not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. St. Augustine wrote, No further would I read, nor need I. For instantly at the end of this sentence, by a light as it were of serenity infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away. And Augustine became a transformed person and a powerful influence in Christianity through the Roman Catholic Church in its early centuries. Or take, for example, the German monk, Martin Luther. He was a Roman Catholic priest, and he had done everything that was suggested to him by which he might find peace with God and Nothing seemed to help. Nothing seemed to bring it about. But, but one day, and he was asked to go teach in Rome, uh, to teach in a uh, ministerial school, a seminary of sorts. And uh, so while in Rome, he picked up the Bible, had never read it before, opened it. It fell open to the book of Romans. And he thought, well, I'm in Rome. I might as well read what it says about Romans. And so he started reading the book of Romans. And when he came across the 17th verse in the first chapter, he read, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, of this experience that he had at that moment, Martin Luther wrote, I began to understand the righteousness of God as that by which the just lives, by the gift of God, namely faith. This straightway made me feel as if reborn, and as though I had entered through open gates into paradise itself. Now, what a testimony. Then there was a young Anglican clergyman, John Wesley. He had been a missionary over to the Americas and messed up, and Man, his heart was heavy. He, he wanted something that he had seen others, a bunch of a group of Moravian Christians on the ship. They didn't seem to have fear like he had. They had a peace that was just amazing, and he wanted that. And so after getting off the ship and walking down at a little church in Aldersgate, he stepped into the church, and there was a layman. They didn't have a priest. There was a layman who couldn't preach but was reading the book of Romans, the book on the book of Romans by Martin Luther. And it was uh, in the preface of that book that they were reading. And uh, <clears throat> he says that while, while he heard the reading that night, he says, um, while he was describing, this is Martin Luther being read, while he, Martin Luther, was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. 
I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Man, what testimonies. So now I want you to join me in this expedition because you see this little book in the sacred library, which produced a spiritual awakening in men of the past, can stir our hearts as well today. And that's what I wanted to do. So what I, what I want to do then is to um, take a look secondly at <clears throat> the, uh, the peaks, the mountain peaks. So let's you and I climb the apex of spiritual insight. Now, I think that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, will assist us in this climb and in these spiritual insights. They're important. They really are. So what I want to do then is, with you, notice what brings justification to a climax. You know, it isn't something that we conjure up. It isn't something that we just one day uh, decide to do. So, But here's what it says. In verse 5 of Romans chapter 5, it says, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now, now wait a minute. We're not talking about what, what uh, in theological terms is called spiritfulness, or um, we would call it in my tribe sanctification. We're talking about an initial work that God does in our hearts. He pours out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Now, this gift is available whether we accept it or not, but there, there is a moment when each of us needs to accept it. I, I picked up this uh, quotation from um, Dr. William Greathouse. It says, um, we, the eschatological people of God, that means end time people of God, are cleansed from sin and given the new life of the Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, in the Christian community is sure proof that we are already living in the new age, enjoying our filial, that means uh, family, relationship with God, and enable to cry out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is like saying Daddy. It's a personal, endearing term. And we have this wonderful privilege by means of the Holy Spirit whom God pours out into our hearts. In Romans chapter 8, there's the climax of the teaching, and, and there it talks about the act by which God makes us holy. But here in chapter 5, we're talking about something else. In chapter 8, we're talking about being separated to him, cleansed by Christ's blood, empowered by his Spirit, available for his person, purpose, destined for glory, alive eternally, and called by his name. But all of that has these other things that lead up to it. The saving grace of God at work in our hearts and our lives to help us become all that God wants us to be. So St. Paul states his purpose then. He says, I long to see you. Now, this is how he opens his book after the greeting, chapter 1, verse 11. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Wow! If there's a gift that can make me strong, I want it, don't you? You see, we have more than just a blessed hope that when we die, we're going to go to heaven we have the possibility of a present experience and relationship with God in Christ Jesus. The love of God floods our inmost hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, prior to this, we can be sour and grumpy and hateful and angry and all kinds of stuff. Now, listen, this is not just a doctrine. 
It's not just an ancient belief that we go back and read about. It's an actual fact in inner life. This divine affection, this love that is poured out, becomes the motive of all of our conduct. We don't serve God. We don't do what he says that we should do. We don't live the way he says we ought just because we're scared. We don't do it because we have to. We do it because we love him. And that love comes from something poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We love because he first loved us. The third thing I want, I want you to see with me here is um, that our opportunity is to receive God's love through his spirit. It's an opportunity. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we earn. And it's, it's not something that on our own we discover. God is offering it. It's a gift he wants to give. But we do have to receive it. So <clears throat> this gift of love from God then is poured into our hearts. It is poured out, it says. Well, out from his great and loving and wonderful heart. Isaiah has a metaphor. Back then, in chapter 44, he even talks about how God says that he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. So the fulfillment of, of uh, the prophet Joel's prophecy about the day of Pentecost, he talks about there will be a day, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So God has been pouring out. He promised he would. He's been doing it. He will do it. He wants to do it for you and for me. It's a privilege extended to Gentiles now. It was back then in the days of Peter in the house of Cornelius. We read that while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And then in the little book of Titus, it's associated, there he associates this gift with the saving love of God. He saved us, he says, not just sanctifies us, but he saved us through the washing of rebirth. And then, then subsequently, there's a renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus, our Savior. So you see, through the Spirit, the gift of God's love is poured into our hearts. The hearts of whom? Well, of those who trust him. Of those who trust him enough to give him permission to transform them, change them, to make them all that he created us to be. It begins with new birth. We have to be born of the Spirit. It isn't something we decide, oh, I hear about commitments to Christ and decisions for Christ. Yes, there needs to be those, but ultimately it's God who does the work. If we are regenerated or born anew, it is because the Spirit of God brings life to our spirit. And by the same Spirit, then, we are called to live a new life. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I, I accepted Jesus when I was 16. But they don't live uh, the Jesus way. They're not believers. They don't take God seriously. Now listen, this is not just the formulation of some new steps or some new habits and ways. You know, read your Bible, go to church, pray, those kind of things. This is not just the old life uh, made new. <clears throat> Let me get back to that. Um, can't get, I can't get this thing to work. Just a minute. I'll get there. <clears throat> this isn't uh, just a retouch. This isn't just a uh, what do they call airbrushing, a, a retouching cosmetically of our life and our character and our inner being. Uh, this, this is called the new life in Christ. And God's way has joy. It has happiness. 
It has hope. It has goodness. We are to be new creatures in Christ. We are to live like newborn babes. We are likened to a new batch of dough without yeast. We, we are growing into what they call, what Paul calls a new man in Ephesians, having a new nature, Ephesians 4, obeying a new commandment, John 13, heirs of a new name, Revelation 2, waiting for new heavens and new earth, 2 Peter, living under a new covenant, Hebrews chapter 8, guided along the new and living way, also in Hebrews, singing a new song, Revelation 5, 9, and going eventually to a new Jerusalem that will come down out of heaven. Glory be to God. What a great heritage we have in the saving work of God through his Holy Spirit. Wow! This life in the Spirit is filled with glorious newness. It really is. Now, I don't want any of us to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. So, <laughs> it's like you and I shouting out, hey, wait for me. I want to get on this bandwagon. We really do. It's got to be more than just a great theory or a history about what God in ancient, did in ancient times. It's got to become a great and personal experience in our own hearts and lives. But nothing ever becomes real until it is experienced. James says, therefore, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept. That's what you and I have to do. Just accept the gift. Accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Wow! What a passage. What a concept. What a blessed privilege. Pray with me, would you, Father? This is more than just a great idea. It, it, it is your offer to us, and we receive it thankfully and joyfully today. Do your work in our hearts and our lives and transform us by your saving grace. And I ask this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Join me again next time. It was good to have you in this moment also.